The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. We're talking about um, generalized linear models, and in generalized linear models, we generalize uh, linear models in two ways. Uh, the first one is to allow for a different distribution for the response variables. And the distributions that we wanted was uh, the exponential family. And uh, this is a family that can be generalized over uh, random variables that are defined on, say, RQ in general with parameters in RK. But we're going to focus in a very specific case where uh, this is when R is equal, uh, Y is a real valued response variable, which is the one you're used to when you're doing uh, linear regression. And the parameter theta also uh, lives in R. And so we're going to talk about the canonical case. So that's the canonical uh, uh, exponential family where you have a density f theta of x, which is of the form exponential uh, minus, uh, sorry, exponential plus, and then we have y, which interacts with theta only by taking a product. Then there's a term that depends only on theta, uh, some dispersion parameter phi, and then we have some normalization factor. Let's call it c of y uh, phi. So it only depends. So it really should not ma matter too much. So it's uh, c of y phi, and that's really just a normalization factor. And here we said that we're going to assume that phi is known. Okay, I just, I have no idea what I write. I don't know if you guys can read. I don't know what chalk has been used today, but uh, I just uh, can't see it. Um, that's not my fault. Um, all right, so we're going to assume that phi is known. And so we saw that, you know, several distributions that we know well, including the Gaussian, for example, belong to this family. And there's other ones, such as Poisson. <laughs> Sorry. Poisson and Bernoulli. So if the PMF has this one, if you have a discrete random variable, this is also valid. And uh, the reason why we introduced this family is because there are going to be some properties. So we know that this thing here, this function b of theta, is essentially what completely characterizes your distribution, right? So if phi is fixed, we know that the interaction has the form, this form, and this really just comes from the fact that we want the function to integrate to 1. So this b here in the canonical form encodes everything we want to know. If I tell you what b of theta is, and of course, I tell you what phi is, but let's say for a second that phi is equal to 1. If I tell you this b of theta, you know exactly what distribution I'm talking about. So it should encode everything that's you know specific to this distribution, such as mean, variance, all the moments that you would want. And uh, uh, we'll see how we can compute from this thing uh, uh, the mean and the variance, for example. So today, we're going to talk about likelihood. And we're going to start with the likelihood function, or the log likelihood for one observation. From this, we're going to do some computations, and then we'll move on to the actual log likelihood based on n independent observations. And here, as we will see, the observations are not going to be identically distributed because we're going to want each of them, I mean, conditionally on x, to have a different, to be a different function of x, okay? To where theta is just a different function of x for each of the observations. All right, so remember the log likelihood and this is for one observation. It's just the log of the density, right? And uh, we have this identity that I mentioned uh, uh, at the end of the class on Tuesday. And this identity is just that the expectation of the derivative of this guy with respect to theta is equal to 0. So let's see why. So if I take the derivative with respect to theta of log f theta of x, what I get is the derivative with respect to theta of f theta of x divided by f theta of x, right? Now, if I take the expectation of this guy with respect to this theta as well, what I get is that this thing, what is the expectation? Well, it's just the integral against f theta. Or if I'm in a discrete case, I just have the sum against f theta, right, if it's a PMF. Just the distribution, the definition of Right, the expectation of x is either the integral, well, let's say of h of x, is the integral of h of x 
f theta of x if this is discrete or it's just the sum of h of x f theta of x if x is discrete. Uh, so if it's continuous, you put this, uh, you know, sweet soft sum. And if it's uh, the, the, this guy, it's the same thing, right? So I'm just going to illustrate the case when it's continuous. So this is what? Well, this is the integral of partial derivative with respect to theta of f theta of x divided by f theta of x all time f theta of x dx. And now this f theta is cancel. So I'm actually left with the integral of the derivative, which I'm going to write as the derivative of the integral. But f theta being, uh, being uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, f theta being a density for any value of theta that I can take, this is the function as a function of theta. Well, actually, as a as a function of theta, this function is constantly equal to 1. Right? For any theta that I take, it takes value 1. So this is constantly equal to 1. I put three bars to say that for any value of theta, this is 1, which actually tells me that the deri derivative is equal to 0. OK? Yes? That the, that's the definition of the expectation. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, that's just the, the definition of the derivative of the log of a function. Log of f prime is oh, okay. f prime over f, right? Oh, okay, okay, okay. That's the log, yeah. Okay. <laughs> just by elimination. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry? Yeah, okay. and, that, and you do good, <laughs> because that's probably how my mind processes. And so I'm like, yeah, L, here's enough information. Um, OK, everybody's good with this? So you know that was convenient. So it just said that the expectation of the derivative of the log likelihood is equal to 0. That's going to be our first identity. Let's move on to the second identity using exactly the same trick, which is Let's hope that at some point we have the integral of this function that's constantly equal to 1 as a function of theta and then should show that it's, use the fact that its derivative is equal to 0. So if I start taking the second derivative of the log, uh, of f of theta, so what is this? Well, it's the second derivative of, it's the derivative of this guy here, so I'm going to go straight to it. So it's second derivative of f theta of x times f theta of x minus second derivative, uh, first derivative of f theta of x times first derivative of f theta of x. Here is some super important stuff. Not kidding. And uh, <laughs> so you can still see that guy over there? All right, so it's just the square. And then I divide by f theta of x squared. OK? So here I have the second derivative times f itself. And here I have uh, the product of the first derivative itself with itself, right? So that's the square. So now I'm going to integrate this guy. So if I take the expectation of this thing here, what I get is the integral. So here, the only thing that's going to happen when I'm going to take my integral is that this one of those squares is going to cancel against f theta, right? So I'm going to get the second derivative Um, minus the second derivative squared and then I'm divided by f theta and I know that this thing is equal to zero okay now, one of this guy here, uh, sorry, why do I have, uh, yeah, so I have this guy here. So this guy here is going to cancel, right? So this is what? This is um, uh, equal to 
uh, the integral of the partial, so the second derivative of f theta of x, right? Because those two guys cancel, minus the integral of the second derivative Okay, and um, this is telling me what? It's telling me that um, Yeah, I'm losing one because I have some weird consequences. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is actually, yeah, okay, because now this is not, uh, well, uh, this is still positive. So I know this thing, I want to say that this thing is actually equal to zero. But then it gives me some weird things, which are that, um, I have the integral of a positive function which is equal to zero. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking to, of doing, but I'm gonna get zero for this entire integral, which means that I have the integral of a positive function which is equal to zero, which means that this function is equal to zero, which uh, sounds a little bad. Basically tells me that this function f theta is linear. Um, so I, I went a little too far, I believe, because I only want to prove that the expectation of the second derivative, um, I want to show that the expectation of the, I mean, is that true actually that, uh, Meh. Um, yeah, so I want to pull this out. And uh, so let's see, if I keep rolling with this, I'm gonna get that, well, no, because the fact that it's divided by f theta means that indeed the second derivative is equal to zero. So I cannot do this here. Okay, uh, maybe I, That's correct. Um, okay, but uh, let's uh, write it like this. So in, you write, so this is what? This is the expectation of the, uh, the partial with respect to theta of f theta of x divided by f theta of x squared, right? And this is the, the exactly the derivative of f of the log, right? So that's indeed, this thing is equal to the expectation with respect to theta of the partial of L, uh, well, of uh, log of, th of theta divided by partial theta. All right, so this is one of the guys that I want squared. So this is one of the guys that I want. And uh, this is actually equal, so this will be equal to the expectation Oh yeah, right, right, right. So this term should be equal to zero. So, yeah, I wanted, this was not zero, you're absolutely right. So uh, at some point I got confused because I thought putting this equal to zero would mean that this is zero, but this thing is not equal to zero. So this thing, you're right, I take the same trick as before and this is actually equal to zero, which means that now I have what's on the left-hand side, which is equal to what's on the right-hand side. And if I recap, I get that E theta of uh, the second derivative of the log of f theta is equal to minus, because I had a minus sign here, to the expectation with respect to theta of log of f theta divided by theta squared. Okay, thank you for uh, being on, the, on watch when I'm uh, falling apart. All right, so this is exactly what you have here, except that both terms have been put on the same side. All right. 
So those things are going to be useful to us. So maybe we should write them somewhere uh, here. And then we have that the expectation of the uh, second derivative of the log. is equal to minus uh, the expectation of the square of the first derivative. OK, and this is indeed my Fisher information. This is just telling me what is the second derivative of uh, my log likelihood at theta, right? So everything is with respect to theta when I take these expectations. And so it tells me that the expectation of the log likely of the of the uh, second derivative, at least first of all, what it's telling me is that it's concave, right? Because the second derivative of this thing, which is the second derivative of the KL divergence, is actually minus something which is must be non-negative, and so it's telling me that it's concave here at this maximum. Okay, and in particular, it's also telling me that it has to be strictly positive unless the derivative of f is equal to zero. So if, unless f is constant, then uh, I don't have, uh, I'm not gonna, it's not gonna change. All right, do you have a question? Okay. So now let's use this. So what does my log likelihood look like when I actually compute it for this canonical exponential family, right? I mean, we have this exponential function, so taking the log should make my life much easier, and indeed it does. So if I look at the canonical, what I have is that the log of f theta of x, well, it's equal simply to y theta minus b of theta divided by phi plus this function that only depends, that does not depend on theta, okay? So let's see what this tells me. What do, let's just plug in those equalities in there, right? I mean, I can take the derivative of the right-hand side and just say that in expectation it's equal to zero. So if I start looking at the derivative, this is equal to what? Well, here I'm gonna pick up only uh, y. Sorry, this is a function of y. Uh, I'm gonna pick only, uh, All right, I was talking about likelihood, so I actually need to put the random variable here. Uh, so I get y minus the derivative of b of theta. Since it's only a function of theta, I'm just gonna write b prime. Is that okay? Rather than having the partial with respect to theta. And then this is a constant. This does not depend on theta, so it goes away. Okay? So if I start taking the expectation of this guy, I get the expectation of this guy, which is the expectation of y minus, well, this does not depend on y, so it's just itself, b prime of theta, and the whole thing is divided by phi, but from my first equality over there, I know that this thing is actually equal to zero. Right? We just proved that. So in particular, it means that since phi is non-zero, it means that this guy must be equal to this guy. Well, phi is not infinity, say. And so that implies that the expectation with respect to theta of y is equal to b prime of theta. I'm sorry, you're not registered in this class. I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. I'm not kidding. You are? Yeah. Well, I've never seen you here. I mean, I saw you for the first lecture. Okay. Uh, all right, so E theta of Y is equal to B prime of theta. Everybody agrees with that? So this is actually nice because if I tell you, okay, I told you, if I give you a, an exponential family, the only thing I really need to tell you is what B theta is. And if I give you b of theta, then you know, computing a derivative is actually much easier than having to integrate y against the density itself. I mean, you could really have fun and try to compute this, which you would be able to do, right? And then there's the uh, 
plus c of y uh, phi, blah, 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 dy. And that's the way you would actually compute this thing. But that would be, uh, that would be really, sorry, that's, this guy is here. That would be painful, right? I don't know what this normalization looks like. So I would have to also explicit that so I can actually compute this thing. And you know, just the same way, if you want to compute the expectation of a Gaussian, well, okay, the expectation of a Gaussian is not the most difficult one, but you know, even if you compute the expectation of a Poisson, you start to have to work a little bit. There's a few things that you have to work through. Here, I'm just telling you, all you have to know is what B of theta is, and then you can just take the derivative. Let's see what the second equality is gonna give us. Okay, so what is the second equality? Uh, it's telling me that uh, if I look at the second derivative and, and then I, took it, I take its expectation, uh, I'm gonna have something which is equal to negative uh, this guy squared. We've already compute, uh, sorry, that, that was the log, right? We've already computed this, uh, this first derivative of the likelihood, right? It's just the expectation of the square of this thing here, All right? So expectation of the derivative with respect to theta of log f theta of x divided by partial theta square. Uh, this is equal to the expectation of the square of y minus b theta divided by phi squared right, uh, b prime theta squared. And, uh, uh, okay, sorry, I'm actually gonna move on with this. Okay, and uh, so if I start computing, what is this thing? Well, this, we just agreed that this was what? The expectation of theta, right? So that's just the expectation, oh, sorry, the expectation of y. We just computed here. Yeah, that's B prime. There's a derivative here. Okay. So now uh, this is what? How c this is simply? Anyone? I'm sorry? Yeah. Variance of y, but there's the scaling by uh, phi squared, right? Okay, so that's, so this is negative of the right-hand side of our inequality, and now I just have to take one more derivative uh, to this guy, right? So if now if I look at, and if I look at the left-hand side now, I have that the partial derivative, the second derivative of log of f theta of, of y divided by partial of uh, theta squared. So this thing is equal to, well now I'm not left with much. The y part is gonna go away and I'm left only with the second derivative of theta uh, minus the second derivative of theta divided by phi. Okay, so if I take expectation, well, it just doesn't change. This is deterministic. So now what I've established is that this guy is equal to negative this guy. So those two things, are the signs are gonna go away. And so this implies that the variance of y is equal to b prime prime theta, and then I have a phi square in the denominator that cancels only one, uh, uh, the phi in the denominator that cancels only one of the phi squares, so it's time phi. So now I have that my second derivative, since I know phi, is completely determined, con determining the variance. All right, and so basically that's what B, that's why B is called the uh, cumulant generating function. It's not generating moments, but cumulants. 
but cumulants in this case correspond basically to the moments, at least for the first two. If I start going fa farther, I'm not gonna have, I'm gonna have more combinations of the expectation of Y3, Y2, and Y itself, okay? So, but you know, as we know, those are the ones that are usually the most uh, useful, at least if we're interested in asymptotic performance. The central limit theorem tells us that all that matters are the first two moments, and then the rest is just gonna go and say, well, it doesn't matter, it's all going to a normal anyway. So let's go to a Poisson, for example, right? So if I had a Poisson distribution, All right, so this is a discrete distribution. And uh, what I know is that, uh, so F, uh, let me call uh, mu the parameter of Y. This is, uh, well, okay, uh, so it's mu to the Y divided by Y factorial exponential minus mu. Okay, so mu is usually called lambda and Y is usually called X. That's why it takes me a little bit of time, but usually it's lambda to the x over factorial x exponential minus lambda. This thing clearly, since this is just the series expansion of the exponential, when I sum those things from zero to infinity, this thing sums to one. But then if I wanted to start understanding what the expectation of this thing is, uh, right? So if I want to understand the expectations with respect to mu of uh, y, then I would have to compute the sum from k equals zero or let's say, yeah, from k equals zero to infinity of um, y times mu, sorry, of k times mu to the k over factorial of k exponential minus mu, which means that I would essentially have to take the derivative, okay, um, that I would have to take the derivative of my, um, uh, series uh, in the end, so you know I can do this. This is a standard exercise. You've probably done it when you took probability, but let's see if we can actually just read it off from the first derivative of b. So to do that, we need to write this in the form of an exponential, where there's one parameter that captures mu that interacts with y, just doing this parameter times y, and then something that depends only on y, and then something that depends only on uh, sorry, something that depends only on, on mu, that's the important one, that's gonna be our b, and then there's gonna be something that depends only on uh, uh, y, okay? So let's write this and check that this f mu indeed belongs to this canonical exponential family. So I definitely have an exponential that comes from this guy, so I have minus mu, and then this thing is gonna give me what? It's gonna give me plus y log mu, and then I'm gonna have minus log of y factorial, right? Okay, so clearly I have a term that depends only on mu, a term that depends only on y, and I have a product of y and something that depends on mu. If I wanna be canonical, I must have this to be exactly the parameter theta itself, okay? So I'm gonna call this guy theta, okay, so theta is log mu, which means that mu is equal to e to the theta. And so wherever I see mu, I'm gonna replace it by u to the theta because my new parameter now is theta. So this is what? This is equal to exponential y times theta, and then I'm gonna have minus e of theta. And then, who cares, something that depends only on, on mu. So this is my c of y, and phi is equal to one in this case. Uh, so that's all I care about. So let me, I mean, let's, let's use it, right? So. Okay, so this is my canonical exponential family. Y interacts with uh, theta exactly like this, and then I have this function. So this function here must be C of theta, right? So from this function, exponential theta, I'm supposed to be able to read what the mean is. So, because since in this course I always know what the dispersion is, I can actually always absorb it into theta for one. 
but here it's really of the form y times something divided by one, right? I mean, I could have, if it was like log of mu divided by five, there would be the question of whether I want to call phi, uh, phi my dispersion, or if I want to just like have it in there. But if I know, uh, so usually, so okay, this makes no difference in practice. But the real thing is when you, it, it's never gonna happen that this thing, this dispersion is gonna be an exact number. If it's an actual numerical number, this just means that this number should be absorbed in the, uh, in the uh, definition of theta. But if it's something that is called sigma, say, and I say, and I will assume that sigma is known, then it's probably uh, preferable to keep it in the dispersion so you can see that there's this parameter here that you can essentially play with. Okay, that's, it doesn't make any difference when you know phi. Okay, so now um, what I have, so, okay, so if I look at the expectation of some y, so now I'm gonna have y which follows my Poisson mu. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna look at the expectation and I know that the expectation is d prime of theta, right? Agreed? That's what I just erased, I think. Uh, agreed with this, the derivative, all right. So what is this? Well, it's the derivative of e to the theta, which is e to the theta, which is mu. So my Poisson is parameterized by its mean. I can also compute the variance, which is equal to uh, minus the second derivative of, uh, is it, uh, no, yeah, uh, no, it's equal to the second derivative of d. Dispersion is equal to one. Again, if I took uh, phi elsewhere, I would see it. Uh, I would see it here as well, right? So if I just absorb phi here, I would see it divided here. So it would not make any difference. And what is the second derivative of the exponential? Uh, it's still the exponential, so it's still equal to mu. Okay. So that certainly makes our uh, life uh, easier. Just uh, one quick remark. Here's, a, here's the B function. I, I'm giving you a problem. Can the B function of some, uh, this, this function B, can it ever be equal to log of theta. Who says yes? Who says no? Why? Yeah, all right, so what I've learned from this uh, sort of completely analytic, right? So we just took derivatives and this thing just happened, right? This thing actually allowed us to relate the second derivative of B to the variance. And one thing that we know about a variance is that this is non-negative and in particular, it's always positive, right? I mean, if I give you uh, an a canonical exponential family that has zero variance, trust me, you will see it, right? I mean, that means that this thing is not gonna look like something that's finite. It means it's gonna have a point mass. It's gonna take value infinity at one point. So this will basically never happen. So this thing is actually strictly positive, which means that this thing is always like strictly concave. It means that the second derivative of this function b has to be strictly uh, positive and so that the function is convex, okay? So this is concave, so this is definitely not working. I need to have something that looks like this when I talk about my b. Okay, so I have theta squared, uh, we'll see a bunch of exponential theta, you know, there's a bunch of them. But if you start writing something and you find B, you know, try to think of the plot of B in your mind and you find that B looks like it's gonna be concave, you're been, you've made a sign mistake somewhere. All right, so we've done a pretty big parenthesis to try to characterize what the distribution of y was gonna be, right? We wanted to extend from say Gaussian to something else. And, uh, but when we're doing regression, which means generalized linear models, we are not interested in the distribution of y, but really the conditional distribution of y given x. 
So I need now to sort of couple those back together. All right, so what I know is that this say mu in this case, which is the expectation, what I want to say is that the conditional expectation of y uh, uh, given mu, sorry, the conditional expectation of y given x, this is some mu of x, right? And when we did linear models, we said, well, this thing was some x transpose beta for linear models. And the whole premise of this chapter is to say, well, this might make no sense because x transpose beta can take the entire range of real values, whereas this mu can take only a partial range. So even if you actually focus on the, uh, on the Poisson, for example, we know that the expectation of a Poisson has to be a non-negative number, actually a positive number as soon as you have a little bit of variance, right? It's mu itself, mu is a positive number, and so it's not gonna make any sense to assume that mu of x is equal to x transpose beta because you might find some x's for which this value ends up being negative. And so we're gonna need what we call the link function that relates, that transforms mu, maps it onto the real line so that you can now express it as of the form x transpose beta. All right, so we're gonna take uh, not this, but we're gonna assume that g of mu of x is now equal to x transpose beta and that's the generalized linear models, right? Okay. So as I said, it's kind of weird to transform x transpose beta, a mu, to make it take the real line. It feels like, at least to me, it feels a bit more natural to take x transpose beta and make it fit to the particular distribution that I want. And so I'm gonna to want to talk about G and G inverse at the same time. So I'm gonna actually take always G, so G is my link function. And I'm gonna want G to be uh, continuously differentiable. Okay, let's say that it has a derivative and its derivative is uh, is uh, continuous, and I'm going to want uh, uh, g to be strictly increasing. Okay, and that actually implies that g inverse exists. Actually, that's not true. Uh, what I'm also going to want is that g of mu uh, spans, uh, okay, how do I do this? Um, uh, well, okay. So I want the G as I range for all possible values of mu, whether they're all positive values or whether they're values that are limited between the interval zero one, I want those to span the entire real line so that what I want to talk about G inverse is defined over the entire real line. I know where I started. Okay, so uh, 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 this implies that G inverse exists. What else does it imply about G inverse? So for a function to be invertible, on, I only need for it to be strictly monotone, right? I don't need it to be strictly increasing. So in particular, the fact that I picked increasing implies that this guy is actually increasing. Okay? Uh, that's the image. Okay. So this is my uh, link function and this slide is just telling me I want my function to be invertible so I can talk about G inverse. I'm gonna switch between the two. So what link functions am I gonna get, right? So for linear models, we just said there's no link function, which is the same as saying that the link function is identity, which certainly satisfies all these conditions. It's invertible, it has all these nice properties, but you know, might as well not talk about it. For Poisson data, when we assume that the conditional distribution of y given x is Poisson, then mu, as I just said, is required to be positive. So I need a g that goes from the interval zero infinity to the entire real line. I need a function that starts from one end and just 
you know, takes not only the, the positive values are split between uh, positive and negative values. And here, for example, I could take the log link, right? So the log is defined on this entire interval. And as I range from zero to plus infinity, the log is ranging from negative infinity to plus infinity, right? So, you know, you can probably think of other functions that do that, like two times log. That's another one, right? But there's many other you can think of. And, uh, but let's say the log is one of them that you might want to think about. Um, then um, there's, uh, um, and we'll see that this is actually, I mean, it is a natural one in the sense that it's one of the first function we can think of, but we'll see also that it has another canonical property that makes it a natural choice. Uh, the other one is uh, the other example where we had an even stronger condition on what mu could be. Mu could only be a number between zero and one. That was the probability of success of a coin flip, right? The probability of success of a Bernoulli random variable. And now I need g to map zero, one to the entire real line. And so here are a bunch of, uh, of things that you can come up with because, you know, now you start to have maybe, I mean, you know, I claim, I will soon claim that this one log of uh, mu divided by one minus mu is the most natural one. But maybe, you know, if you had never thought of this, that might not be the, most, the first function you would come up with, right? Uh, you mentioned trigonometric functions, for example. Uh, so, you know, maybe you can come up with something that like, you know, comes from, I don't know, hyper, um, uh, hyperbolic trigonometry or something. So what does this function do? Well, we'll see a picture, but this function does map the interval zero, one to the entire real line. We also discussed the fact that if we think reciprocally, uh, well, a function, uh, what I want, if I want to think about G inverse, I want a function that maps the entire real line into the unit interval. And as we said, if I'm not a very creative statistician or probabilist, I can just pick my favorite continuous, strictly increasing uh, uh, cumulative distribution function, which as we know, will arise as soon as I have a density that has support on the entire real line. Right? If I have support everywhere, then it means that my, uh, uh, by meaning that the, func the density is strictly positive everywhere, then it means that my uh, uh, community distribution function has to be strictly increasing. And of course it has to go from zero to one because that's just the nature of those things. And so for example, I can take the Gaussian, that's one such function, but I could also take you know, the double exponential that looks like an exponential on one end and then an exponential on the other end. And, uh, 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 basically, if you take uh, something which is called, uh, which you, if you take capital Phi, which is the um, a Gaussian, standard Gaussian cumulative distribution function, it does work for you and you can take its inverse. And in this case, we don't talk about, so this guy is called log it or log it, and this guy is called prob it. And you see it usually every time you have a package on uh, uh, generalized linear models uh, you're trying to implement, you have this choice and for what's called logistic regression, so it's kind of funny that it's called logistic regression, but you can actually use the probit link, which in this case is get, I guess it's called probit regression. But those things are essentially equivalent and it's really a matter of taste, okay? Uh, maybe of community, some communities might prefer one or the other. I uh, will see that again, uh, as I claimed before, the logistic one, the logit one, uh, is, uh, has a slightly more compelling argument for its reason to exist. I guess this one, the compelling argument is that it's involved the central, uh, the standard Gaussian, which of course is something that should show up everywhere. And then you can think about crazy stuff, okay? Something that even, even crazy gets a name, uh, com complementary log log, which is the log of minus log one minus. Okay, you know, why not? Um, so I guess you can iterate that thing, right? You can just do put a one, log one minus in front of this thing and it's still gonna go. All right, so um, that's not true. I have to put a minus and take another, well, I don't know. No, that's not true. Okay, so, um, okay, so you can think of whatever you want, but now um, uh, you can actually, so I, I'll, I'll show, so I claim that the log it link is the natural choice. So here's a picture. I should have actually plotted the other one uh, so we can actually compare it. Uh, to be fair, I don't even remember how it would actually fit in those, uh, in those two functions. So the blue one, which is this one for those of you who don't see the difference between blue and red, sorry about that. Uh, so this is the, so the blue one is the uh, uh, logistic one. So that's, okay, 
So this guy is the function that does e to the x uh, over 1 plus e to the x. As you can see, this is a function that's supposed to map the entire real line into the interval uh, 0, 1. Okay? So that's supposed to be the inverse of your function. And I claim that this is the inverse of the logistic of the logit function. And the blue one, well, this is the Gaussian CDF. So you know it's clearly the inverse of the inverse of the Gaussian CDF. And that's the red one. That's the one that goes here. So one of the things uh, that uh, I would guess that the complementary log log is something that's probably going above here and for which the slope is actually even a little flatter as you cross uh, zero, okay? Um, so, okay, so of course this is not our link functions. These are the inverse of our link functions. So what do they look like when I actually basically flip my, uh, my thing like this? So this is what I see, okay? And so I can see that in blue, this is my logistic link. So I have, it crosses zero with a slightly faster rate. Remember, our hope, if we could use the identity, that would be very nice to us, right? We would just want to take the identity. The problem is that if I start uh, you know, having the identity that goes here, it's gonna start being a problem. And this is the, um, um, uh, the, the Provit uh, link, the phi inverse that you see here, it's a little flatter. Uh, I mean, you can check, right, what, uh, you can compute the derivative uh, at zero of those guys, and you will see that the, what is the derivative of the, so log, so I'm taking the derivative of log of x over uh, 1 minus x, so it's uh, 1 over x uh, minus 1 over x, no, uh, minus 1 over uh, 1 minus x. Okay, so if I look at 0, 0.5 actually, sorry, this is the interval 0, 1, so I'm interested in the slope at 0, 0.5, so no. Uh, yes, yeah, plus, thank you. So at 0, 0.5, what I get is uh, 2 plus 2. Yeah, okay, so that's, okay, so that's the slope that we get, and if you compute for uh, the derivative, what is the derivative of phi inverse? Well, it's uh, little phi of x divided by little phi of capital phi inverse of x. So little phi at, at one half, I don't know. Um, yeah, I guess I can probably compute the derivative of capital phi at zero, which is gonna be just uh, one over square root two pi and then just say, well, the slope has to be, you know, one over that. Um, okay, so, you know, square root two pi. Um, okay, so that's just a comparison, but again, so far we do not have any reason to prefer one to the other. And so now I'm gonna start giving you some reasons to prefer one to the other. And uh, one of those two, and actually for each canonical family, there is something which is called the canonical link. And when you don't have any other reasons to choose anything else, why not choose the canonical one? And the canonical link is the one that says, okay, what I want is G to map mu onto the real line, right? And, but mu is not the parameter of my canonical family, right? I mean, it just so here, for example, mu is e of theta, but the canonical parameter is theta. And uh, but the, the parameter of a canonical exponential family is something that lives in the entire real line, right? It was defined for all thetas. And so in particular, I can just assume, I can just take theta to be the one that's x transpose beta. And so in particular, I'm just gonna try to find the link that just says, okay, when I take g of mu, I'm gonna map, so that's what's gonna be, right? So I know that g of mu is gonna be equal to x beta, and now what I'm gonna say is say, okay, let's just take the g that makes this guy equal to theta, so that this is theta that I actually model like x transpose beta. Feels pretty canonical, right? I mean, what else? What other central easy choice would you take? This was pretty easy. There is a natural parameter for this canonical uh, family and it takes value on the entire real line. I have a function that maps mu onto the entire real line, so let's just map it to the actual parameter. Okay, so now 
uh, what I claim, uh, okay, why do I have this? Well, we've already figured that out. The canonical link function is strictly increasing. Okay, oh, sorry. So I said that, so now I want this guy. So I want mu, g of mu, to be equal to theta, which is equivalent to saying that I want mu to be equal to g inverse of theta. But we know that mu is what? B prime of theta. So that means that B prime is the same function as G inverse. And I claim that this is actually giving me indeed a function that has uh, the properties that I want because before I said just pick any function that has these properties and now I'm giving you a very hard rule to pick this, so you need still to check that it satisfies those conditions, in particular that it's increasing and invertible. And so for this to be increasing and invertible, strictly increasing and invertible, really what I need is that the inverse is strictly increasing and invertible, which is the case here because uh, uh, B prime, as we said, well, B prime is the derivative of a strictly convex function. A strictly convex function has a second derivative that's strictly positive. We just figured it out using the fact that the variance was strictly positive. And if phi is strictly positive, then uh, this thing has to be uh, uh, strictly positive. So if b prime prime is strictly positive, this is the derivative of a function called b prime. If your derivative is strictly positive, you are strictly increasing. And so we know that b prime is indeed strictly increasing. And uh, what I need also to check, well, I guess uh, this is already checked in its own because uh, B prime is actually um, mapping all of R into uh, the, va the possible values. I mean, when theta ranges on the entire real line, then B prime ranges in the entire interval of the, the mean values that it can take, right? And so now I have this thing that's completely defined. B prime inverse is a valid link. And it's called the canonical link. Okay, so again, if I give you an exponential family, which is another way of saying you, I give you a convex function B, which you know gives you some exponential family. Then if you just take B prime inverse, this gives you the associated canonical link for this canonical exponential family. All right? So let's see why, so okay, clearly there's an advantage of doing this, which is I don't have to actually think about which one to pick if I don't wanna think about it. But uh, uh, there's other advantages that come to it and we'll see that in the representation, there's basically gonna be some light cancellations that show up. So before we go there, let's just compute the canonical link for the Bernoulli distribution. All right, so remember the Bernoulli distribution has a PMF which is part of the canonical exponential family. All right, so the PMF of the Bernoulli is uh, uh, F theta of X is, uh, okay, so let me just write it like this. So it's P to the X, one, so P to the Y, let's say, one minus P to the one minus Y, which I will write as exponential Y log P plus uh, one minus y log one minus p. Okay, we've done that last time. Now I'm gonna group my terms in y to see how y interacts with this parameter p. And what I'm getting is y, which is times log p divided by one minus p. And then the only term that remains is log one minus p, okay? Now, I want this to be a canonical exponential family, which means that I just need to call this guy. So it is part of the exponential family. I can read that. If I want it to be canonical, this guy must be theta itself. Okay, so I have that theta is equal to log p one minus p. If I invert this thing, it tells me that p is e to the theta divided by one plus e to the theta, right? That's just inverting this function. And so that means that this thing is actually, so in particular, it means that log one minus P is equal to log one minus this thing. So the exponential thetas go away. So 
in the numerator, so this is what I get, right? That's the log one minus this guy, which is equal to minus log one plus e to the theta, okay? So I'm going a bit fast, but these are very elementary manipulations. Maybe it requires one more line to convince yourself, but uh, yeah, just do it in the comfort of your room. And then what you have is the exponential of y times theta, and then I have minus log one plus e theta. Okay, so this is the representation of the PMF of a Bernoulli distribution as part of a member of the canonical exponential family. And it tells me that B of theta is equal to log one plus E of theta. That's what I have there. From there, I can compute the expectation, which you know, hopefully I'm gonna get P as the mean and P times one minus P as the variance. Otherwise that would be weird. Um, so let's just do this. B prime of theta should give me the mean. And indeed, B prime of theta is e to the theta divided by one plus e to the theta, which is exactly this P that I had there. Okay, just for fun, uh, let's, uh, comp well, I don't know, maybe that's not part of it. Yeah, let's not compute the second derivative. It's probably gonna be on your homework at some point. Um, if not on the final. Uh, all right, so B prime now, we know, oh, I erased it, of course. Um, G, the canonical link is B prime inverse. And I claim that this is gonna give me the legit function, log of mu over one minus mu. So let's check that. So B prime is this thing. Uh, so now I want to find the inverse. Well, I should really call my inverse a function of P and I've done it before, right? All I have to do is to solve this equation, which I've actually just done it. That's where I'm actually coming from. So it's actually telling me that the solution of this thing is uh, equal to log of P over one minus P. Okay, it just solved this thing both ways. And this is indeed log it of P by definition of log it. So B prime inverse, this function that seemed to come out of nowhere is really just the inverse of B prime, which we know is the canonical link and canonical is some sort of ad hoc choices that we've made by saying, let's just take the link so that G of mu is giving me the actual canonical parameter theta. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Um, now, of course, I'm going through all this trouble, but you could see it immediately. I know this is gonna be theta. We also have prior knowledge, hopefully, that the expectation of a Bernoulli is P itself. So right at this step, when I say that I'm gonna take theta to be this guy, I already knew that the canonical link was the logit link. Because I just said, oh, here's theta and it's just this function of mu, bim. Okay, so you can do that for a bunch of examples and this is what they're gonna give you. So in the Gaussian case, B of theta, we've actually computed it actually once. This is theta square over two. So the derivative of this thing is really just theta, which means that G or G inverse is actually equal to the identity, okay? And again, sort of, you know, sanity check. When I'm in the Gaussian case, there's nothing general about general linear models. They don't have a link. The Poisson case, uh, you can actually check. Uh, did we do this actually? Yes, we did it, right? So that's when we had this E of theta. And so B is E of theta, which means that the natural link is the inverse, which is log, uh, which is the inverse of exponential. And uh, so that's the log logarithm link, which as I said, you know, I, I use the word natural. Now you can also use the word canonical if you want to describe this function 
as being the right function to map the positive real line to the entire real line. The Bernoulli, we just did it. So uh, B, the cumulative uh, uh, cumulative engineering function is log of one plus E of theta, which is log of uh, mu over one minus mu. And, uh, and uh, gamma function, where you have the thing you're gonna see is log, uh, minus log of minus delta. You see this, this is the reciprocal link is the link that actually shows up. So uh, minus one over mu, okay? That maps, this is another, uh, link, sorry, this is, um, okay, uh, yeah, okay, that's the one. Okay, so, um, are there any questions about canonical links? canonical families, I use the word canonical a lot, uh, but uh, is everything fitting together right now? Right, so we have this function, we have a canonical exponential family by assumption, it has a function b, which contains every information we want. We just, at the beginning of the lecture, we established that it has information about the mean in the first derivative, about the variance in the second derivative, and it's also giving us the canonical link, all right? So just cherish this b once you've found it because it's everything you need, yeah. I don't know, um, political preference. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I don't know, honestly, uh, if I were, you know, a serious practitioner, I probably would have a better answer for you. At this point, I just don't. I think it's a matter of practice and, 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 and actual preferences. You can also try both. You, we didn't mention it, but you know, there's this idea of cross-validation. Well, we mentioned it without going too much detail. But you know, you could try both and see which one performs best on a yet unseen data set in terms of prediction and just say, I prefer this one of the two because this actually comes as part of your modeling assumption, right? You modeled, not only did you decide to model the image of mu through the link function as a linear model, but it, you really, really what you're saying, right? Your model is saying, well, so you have two pieces of neural, the distribution of y, but you also have the fact that mu is modeled as G inverse of X transpose beta, and for different Gs, this is just different modeling assumptions, right? So, you know, why should this be be linear? This thing be linear? I don't know. My my, you know, my authority uh, as a person who's not examined the thousand data sets uh, for both things would be that the changes are fairly minor. Okay, so this was all for one observation. We just, you know, basically did probability, right? To describe some density, some properties of the densities, how to compute expectations. That was really just probability. There was no data involved at any point. We did a bit of modeling, but it was all for one observation. What we're gonna try to do now is given do the, you know, the reverse engineering to probability that is statistics, given data, what can I infer about my model? Now remember, there's three parameters that are sort of floating around in this model, right? There are one that was theta, there are one that was mu, and there are one that is beta, okay? So those are the three parameters that are floating around. What we wanted to say, what we said is that the expectation of y given x is mu of x, okay? So if I estimate mu, I know the conditional expectation of y given x, which definitely gives me theta of x, right? How do I go from mu of x to theta of x? Yeah. The inverse of what? Of the arrow? Yeah, <laughs> sure, but how do, I, uh, how do I go from this guy to this guy? So theta as a function of mu is? Yeah, right, so we just computed that mu was b prime of theta. So it means that theta is just b prime inverse of mu, okay? So those two things are the same as far as we're concerned because we know that b prime is strictly increasing, it's invertible, so it's just a matter of reparameterization and we just can switch from one to the other whenever we want. 
But why we go through mu? Because you know, so far for the entire semester, I told you there's one parameter that's theta, it does not have to be the mean, and that's the parameter that we care about is the one on which we want to do inference. That's the one for which we're going to compute the Fisher information. This was the parameter that was, you know, our object of worship, and now I'm saying, oh, I'm going to have mu that like coming around. And why we have mu is because this is the mu that we use to go to beta. All right, so I can go freely from b prime to, uh, uh, from theta to mu using d prime or b prime inverse. And now I can go from mu to uh, beta because I have that g of mu of x is beta transpose x. Okay, so in the end now, this is gonna be my object of worship. This is gonna be the parameter that matters because once I set beta, I set everything else through this chain. So the question is, if I start stacking up this pile of parameters, right? So I start with my uh, beta, which in turn gives me a mu, which in terms gives me a theta. Can I just have like a long streamlined, uh, uh, can I, what, what, what is the outcome when I actually start writing my likelihood, not as a function of theta, not as a function of mu, but as a function of beta, which is the one at the end of the chain, okay? And hopefully things are gonna happen nicely and they might not, yeah. It's g, it's g, that's my link, right? g of mu of x, now it's mu is a function of x because it's conditional on x. Okay, so this is really theta of x, mu of x, but b is not a function of x because it's just, uh, it's just something that tells me what the function of x is. Mm -hmm. Mu is the conditional expectation of y given x. It has actually a fancy name in the statistics literature. It's called, anybody knows the name of this function, mu of x, which is the conditional expectation of y given x? That's the regression function. That's the actual definition. If I tell you what is the definition of the regression function, that's just the conditional expectation of y given x. And uh, it's just, you know, I could look at any property of the conditional distribution of y given x, I could look at the conditional 95th percentile. I could look at the conditional median. I could look at the conditional interquartile range. I could look at the conditional variance. But I decide to look at the conditional expectation, which is uh, a, a called the regression function. Okay, yeah. Oh, there's no transpose here. Uh, actually, only Victor Emmanuel uses prime for transpose, and I found it confusing with the derivative. So prime here is only a derivative. Oh, yeah, sorry, beta transpose x. Sorry, I thought you said, okay. So you said what? I said that g of mu of x is beta transpose x. Is, isn't that the same thing? Those the x is a vector here, right? So x transpose beta and beta transpose x are, are the same thing. Right, so beta is, looks like this, x looks like this, so it's just a simple, num simple number. Yeah, you're right, when I I'm gonna start to look at matrices, I'm gonna have to be slightly more careful when I do this. Okay, so let's do the reverse engineering. I'm giving you data. From this data, hopefully you should be able to get what the conditional, if I give you an infinite amount of data, you would know exactly what the, of pairs x, y, you would know exactly what the conditional distribution of y given x is. And uh, in particular, you would know what the conditional expectation of uh, y given x is, which means that you would know mu, which means that you would know theta, which means that you would know beta. Okay, now when I have a finite number of observations, I'm gonna try to estimate mu of x but really I'm gonna go the other round, way around because the fact that I assume specifically that mu of x is of the form g of mu of x is x transpose beta, then that means that I only have to estimate beta which is a much simpler object than the entire regression function. Okay, and so that's what I'm gonna go for. I'm gonna try to represent the likelihood, of the log likelihood of my data as a function not of theta, not of mu, but of beta. And then maximize that guy. All right. So now, rather than thinking of just one observation, I'm gonna have a bunch of observations. 
And every time you see here, so this might actually look a little confusing, but uh, let's just make sure that uh, we understand each other before we go any further. So I'm going to have observations. x1, y1, all the way to xn, yn, just like in a natural regression problem. Except that here my y's might be 0, 1 valued, they might be positive valued, they might be exponential, they might be anything in the uh, canonical exponential family. And um, okay, so I have this uh, I have this thing, and now what I have is that so my observations are x1, y1, xn, yn, and what I want is that uh, I'm going to talk about I'm going to assume that the conditional expectation of yi given x sorry yeah the conditional the conditional distribution of yi given xi is something that has density. Did I put an I on Y? Yeah. I'm not going to deal with the phi and the C now. And what, why do I have theta I and not theta? Is because theta I is really a function of the, f of, um, uh, of xi, right? So it's really theta i of xi. But what do I know about theta i of xi? It's actually equal to um, b, ah, I did this error twice, b prime inverse of mu of xi. Okay. And I also know that this thing is actually, I'm going to assume that this is of the form beta transpose xi. Okay, and this is why I have a theta i, is because this theta i is a function of xi, and I'm going to assume a very simple form of this thing. Sorry, 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 sorry. That's, uh, yeah, sorry, I should not write it like this. This is only when I have the canonical length. So this is actually equal to b prime inverse of g of xi transpose beta. And when I have the canonical link, sorry, G inverse, those two things are actually canceling each other. Okay? So as before, I'm going to stack everything into some, uh, well, actually, I'm not going to stack anything for the moment. I'm just going to give you a peek at what's happening next week uh, rather than just manipulating uh, the data. All right. So. Here's how we're going to proceed at this point. Well, now I'm going to want to write my likelihood function not as a function of theta, but as a function of beta, because that, that's the parameter I'm actually trying to maximize, right? So if I have a link, so this thing that matters here, I'm going to call h. By definition, this is going to be h of xi transpose beta. Helena, you have a question? Okay, so right, so this is just uh, all the things that we know, right? Theta is just the, by definition of the fact that mu is B prime of theta, the mean is B prime of theta, it means that theta is B prime inverse of mu, and then uh, mu is modeled from the systematic component, G of mu is Xi transpose beta, so this is G inverse of Xi transpose beta. So then when I have B prime inverse of G prime of G inverse, this function is a bit annoying to say, so I'm just going to call it h. And when I do the composition of two inverse, it's the inverse of the composition of those two things in the reverse order. So h is really the inverse of g composed with b prime, g of b prime inverse. Okay, and now if I have the canonical length, since I know that g is b prime inverse, this is really just the identity. So as you can imagine, this entire thing which is actually quite complicated, would just say, oh, this thing actually does not show up when I have the canonical link. I really just have that theta i can be replaced by xi of beta. So think about going back to this guy here. Now beta, uh, theta becomes only xi transpose beta. That's going to be much more simple, uh, simple to optimize because remember, when I'm going to do log likelihood, this thing is going to go away. I'm going to sum those guys. 
And so what I'm going to have is something which is essentially linear in beta. And then I'm going to have this minus b, which is just minus the sum of convex functions of beta. And so I'm going to have to bring in the tools of convex optimization. Now it's not just going to be tick the gradient set it to zero. It's going to be more complicated to do that. I'm going to have to do that in an iterative fashion. And so that's what I'm telling you when you look at your log likelihood for all those functions. You sum, the exponential goes away because you had the log, and then you have all these things here. I kept the b, I kept the h, but if h is the identity, this is the linear function, the linear part, y i times x i transpose beta minus b of my theta, which is now only x i transpose beta. And that's the function I want to maximize in beta. Okay? So that's a simple, I mean, it's a convex function. When I know what b is, I have an explicit formula, formula for this. And I want to just uh, bring in some optimization. And uh, that's uh, what we're going to do. And we're going to see three different methods, which are really basically the same method. It's something which is based on, it's just a adaptation or a specialization of the so-called Newton-Raphson method, which is essentially telling you do iterative local quadratic approximations to your function. So second order Taylor expansion, minimize this guy, and then do it again from where you were. Okay? And uh, we'll see that this can be actually implemented using what's called iteratively reweighted least squares, which means that every step, since it's just a quadratic, it's going to be just squares in there, every step can actually be solved by using a weighted uh, least squares version of the problem. Okay, so uh, I'm going to stop here for today. So we'll continue and uh, uh, probably not finish this chapter, but finish next week. And, uh, and then I think there's only one uh, lecture. Um, actually, for the last lecture, what do you guys want to do? Do you want to have uh, donuts and cider? Do you want to uh, do you want to just have like some more like uh, outlooking uh, uh, lecture on you know what's uh, happening uh, post 1975 in statistics? Uh, do you want to have a, a review for the final exam? Pragmatic people. All right. You want to do interesting advanced. Oh, for the last lecture? Yeah. yeah, so that's sort of. Yeah, the thing is, I think, uh, so this, there's two, that, that's basically what I'm asking, right? Interesting advanced topics versus, uh, uh, let's, like, ask me any question you want. Those questions can be about interesting advanced topics, though. <laughs> like, what are interesting advanced topics? I'm sorry? Like, you can do the donuts. Yeah, yeah, we can always do the donuts. <laughs> we can always do the donuts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll do that. All right, see you guys. Have a good weekend.